Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah tonight, and I'm going to be focusing especially in the 36th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 36, and these are, we're looking at the last chapters of the first section of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, or uh, Isaiah 1, or book 1. Uh, there's clearly a division at, at chapter 40, a change of, of emphasis, although the arguments that we've been making, uh, the, the things that we've been learning from Isaiah, that our God has left evidences, he's left testimony, that we might believe not only in him, but also in his plan of salvation that he is a God who cares about all men, and that in order to appeal to us as reasonable human beings, as rational creations of God, uh, God calls upon us to examine what he has put in his book. Uh, our faith is based upon truth. It's upon evidences. It's, it's based upon those, uh, those proofs that God has left in his book. There, there are many areas of apologetics aside from those within the Bible. Uh, we can talk about the evidences of archaeology that uh, appears to confirm the historicity of the Bible, and we can talk about other such uh, cause and effect type arguments that were used even by those who did not believe in the God of the Bible. But there is no argument more powerful to give faith in us than the arguments that are found in the Bible itself. And we need to believe that. We need to look for those proofs and be convinced of what we read about Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. And Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so that's what we're going to do. We've been looking at how that, that God is or God has uh, governed the world. He has governed the nations according to righteous principles throughout all of human history. And Isaiah calls upon us to observe that and acknowledge that. And that's a testimony. The nation of Israel themselves are witnesses. They, they've had close contact with our Creator God. And, and those experiences, as they are written down and brought down to us today, are also a part of that testimony about God's righteous government of the world. The other argument that you find in Isaiah that we've been talking about recently is that God predicts the destiny of many nations in the book of Isaiah in detail. Many of those nations don't exist today, but we read about them in the Bible, and, and we can find evidences of their existence through archaeology and through uh, remnants of uh, writings on uh, potsherds, pieces of pottery that have been left in the ruins of cities throughout the Middle East. And we can find the reality, but the, the, the fact is those nations uh, were judged by God and they were erased from the face of the earth. Isaiah writes in those times when God did that, explains why he did it and how he did it. We're coming to somewhat the close of that second argument uh, in this study tonight. And Lord willing, we'll get into the third argument, that is uh, the arguments uh, based upon God's prophecy about the Savior, God's prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Numerous prophecies, and we'll go back and look at uh, as many of those as we can. Now, in chapter 36 of, of Isaiah, we we have a very specific experience with an 
empire that was being established at that very time. It was not the first of those great empires in ancient times, but it was the first one that was as great or as large and left as so much of an imprint on the world in which we live. And that was the empire of the Assyrians, whose capital city was in the headwaters of the Tigris River, uh, there in Nineveh. But they had conquered the land down the river all the way to the mouth. The two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and all of those nations. And uh, they had also gone on the other side of the Fertile Crescent, down into the land, uh, the caravan route from the, the, the east to the land of Africa, passing through the land that we know of as Israel, along the Jordan River Valley. Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and those caravan routes that would go down into Egypt and in Ethiopia. Now, all of those nations are being touched here, but in chapter 36, we're seeing a specific moment when the armies of Assyria, this time under the king Sennacherib, is invading the land of Judah. And he comes into the lands all around Jerusalem, all the way up to the gates of Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah. And we get uh, a very detailed look uh, at, about the or at the atmosphere and the language and the issues that were being brought up at that time. And it fits. It fits everything we know from the monuments and the inscriptions that still exist today from the Assyrians. We have monuments to Sennacherib that are ex ex extant that we can read. And, and uh, Tiglath, -Pile Tiglath Pileser, I don't know if I said that right or not, but uh, there in Sargon, there were a number of Assyrian emperors and empires before him. But now here we're getting, it's getting bigger and bigger and more and more powerful. And Sennacherib now is knocking on the door of Jerusalem. Let's read a little bit in verse 1. The 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib king of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Okay? That's how, that's how this history had unfolded. He was already successful in taking nearly all the fortified cities. Fortified means what? Okay, they had these enormous walls, uh, just kind of like in, in uh, the, the Middle Ages of Europe. When you had so much warfare, uh, so many invaders from, I mean, just constantly, uh, in, in order to have any security, you had to have a a fortified city, and then you had other towns all around there where people would farm and, and carry on their life as usual, but when a, an, an enemy army was marching toward you, everybody would run to the city and, and find security within the walls of these fortified cities. That's the way, that's the, way uh, the land of Canaan was when Israel invaded. They had to overthrow these, these lands by getting through the fortified walls that protected the cities. It, <clears throat> reading on down, it says, And the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh. Now, when you see the Rabshakeh, that's correct. That was not his name. It's a title. And you can kind of see in the Hebrew language, uh, the nature of the title in the word Rab, because we also have the word Rab in the New Testament. Rabbi. Okay. Who were the rabbis? Okay, these were kind of the teachers. It was a way of calling their teachers Lord or Master. And that was one of those things that, that Jesus 
criticized and condemned about the attitudes of the Jews toward their leaders, toward their teachers. Call no man Lord. Remember that? Or Father or Master. Um, so the Rab, Shekha, that was his title, from, okay, word, uh, the king w- uh, was at Lachish. Uh, we have all the archaeological uh, evidences that have been uncovered uh, of this very uh, war. The, the burn layer in Lachish is well known in modern archaeological circles. So this was a real historical event. Okay, the, the king is, has, is taking Lachish, uh, which is down toward the coast, and now he's sending his Rabshak, his captain or general, something like that, up to up the mountain, up to Jerusalem, and preparing them, trying to see if he can persuade them to not fight. They would a lot rather not fight. They'd rather just but they, they weren't offering to compromise. They were just saying, you know, just just give up. Let's read, read some more. He says, um, he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, son of, Hil- son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, or that's the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. Uh, and I'm sorry, the re- recorder would be the scribe. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Okay. We're being introduced to a very important word in the book of Isaiah, and this word, trust. The whole idea of trusting in the Lord is an issue throughout the prophets, especially here in Isaiah. And it's also a prophet when Christ, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a point of emphasis in the teachings of Christ. Now, I think we have a little bit of confusion over this word trust. What would the equivalent be in the New Testament? Would it be faith or would it be hope? I'm not trying to trick you, but I'd like to suggest to you that the word uh, the word trust in the Hebrew language is more closely identified with the word hope in the Hebrew than it is with the word faith or belief. For that reason, it's tied to the idea of hope. You can't separate faith from it. Right. Right, and and the idea, the, the word faith is a big word in the Bible. It, it it covers a lot of territory. Of course, the word hope does too. But uh, you have the analysis there in in Hebrews eleven verse one. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, but you you don't see it. But hope is a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing to motivate and to fortify us in being faithful. And, of course, the word faithful reflects the word faith, the word belief. So you really can't separate the two. But here he's especially talking about, he's illustrating the meaning of the word. Uh, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you've rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Okay, that, what does it mean, trust in Egypt, trust in Pharaoh? Have reliance in him. Okay. Have reliance or 
Reliance, okay. Depend on him. Someone, you're, you're thinking that if I get into trouble, I can call Egypt and they'll come rescue me. They will save me from my enemies. So that's trust in a political alliance. Uh, much of the book of Isaiah and the first half touches this theme of the, the, the erroneous faith that they had in alliances or trust or hope in what men might be able to do. And, and God saying over and over again, uh, if God has determined to judge you, there's no man who will save you. And here, Egypt especially, uh, he's speaking of them because he has not conquered Egypt yet. But he's about to. Yet, right. He wasn't there yet. The, the verdict was not in on Egypt. Um, and later, you see Egypt coming out to help, uh, you know, 100 years later, uh, in the days of Babylon, you remember. And that's how Josiah died. Um, he thought he would go out, he would team up with Babylon and stop Egypt. And that was a mistake. But in any case... Uh, here, here is this Rabshakeh describing what his political analysis was of the mentality inside the walls of Jerusalem. He says in verse 7, But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord. Okay, that word is in all caps. He's saying Jehovah. In his mind, Jehovah is just another one of the gods. The problem with the word Lord is they use the word Lord also, and uh, Baal was also translated as Lord. And so uh, I prefer, you know, I, I really don't like the idea of them uh, compromising with whoever, whoever it is they compromise with and, and put the word Lord in all caps instead of just writing out the name Jehovah. Because it's confusing. In whom, okay, we trust in Jehovah, our God. Okay? If you say that to me, he's saying, all right, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Okay? We get the point of view of the Rabshakeh about the religious issue of Jehovah. What issue does he bring up? He removed the high places of Jehovah. What's he talking about? That's what the world, the general idea in the world was that you had many high places in wh where you would go and serve Jehovah. But going back to Moses and the law, even before they had the temple in Jerusalem, God commanded them not to do that, but to worship at one place, the place that he would choose. And he did. And when did they finally move the tabernacle to Jerusalem. Who was king? Well, in Solomon's time, he built the temple. David actually, in his time, they moved the tabernacle there. That was after all of that, the scandal, you remember, of, uh, of Uzzah and, and moving the, the, the uh, yes. Right. 
it makes us ask the question, what difference would it make anyway? You know, it, many of the kings permitted the, the uh, worship in high places, contrary to the law of Moses, but many kings permitted it, even those some, uh, who basically were doing mostly what was right. I mean, this was an exceptional thing that Hezekiah did. He removed those high places. He would not let them worship there. Uh, that was a major step. Uh, but they were worshiping Jehovah, weren't they? What difference was a little detail like that? I think we see in this chapter that it did make a big difference before God whenever they were under the threat uh, of Sennacherib. This is a part of Hezekiah's trust in Jehovah. He was going to trust in whatever Jehovah wanted down to the last detail. Now, he says, Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you uh, 2,000 horses if you were able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Uh, what, what is that? Yes. Yeah. He's saying you're pitiful. You got nothing. How are you? How do you? You're, you're dreaming if you think that you're going to be able to defeat the Assyrians. Uh, you don't even have two thousand uh, horsemen. <laughs> You don't have 2,000 horses, but I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can mount 2,000 horsemen on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But is he not making a point? We just read in the first verse, he had already taken all the fortified cities. And who was inside those fortified cities? You suppose there might have been some soldiers in those cities? How many soldiers did they have left? I mean, you can, you can imagine that the soldiers that might have been huddled inside the gates of Jerusalem might not have been that many at this point. And so Hezekiah could not deny this point. But then he says, moreover, it is, or is it without Jehovah that I have come up against this land to destroy it? Jehovah said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Is that true? <laughs> okay. Uh, is it true or not? I've had a vision of Jehovah. Exactly. He spoke to me. He would know the message of, of, the of Isaiah himself. Of yeah. Absolutely. I think that's what I think is what's going on here. I, I think the fact is these prophecies of Isaiah and other prophets, I believe, were known. Outside of it, these were not private, <laughs> these were not secrets that were guarded by Israel. No, these, these were messages that were announced to all the world, but to Israel, but then to all the world by extension. Uh, would they not know? I think they did. And so uh, he, could, he could argue, well, hi, your own prophets have been saying, you know, that God has raised us up to to uh, defeat you. So what are you resisting for? Um, in any case, uh, the Lord, I don't believe, I don't believe spoke to him in a dream or in a vision or sent a prophet and told him this. Like Jonah, you might, you know, when he, Jonah went to Nineveh, it's nothing like that. It's just some more of this uh, braggadocious talk. Verse 11, Then Eliakim, Shebna, and jo Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. 
Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who were on the wall. Okay, here we have an introduction to languages. Okay. What languages were they speaking in the land of Nineveh? Apparently Aramaic. Or at least they knew Aramaic. Aramaic apparently was the land of that region. It was, a, it was spoken, widely spoken by the political classes perhaps there in Assyria. Certainly Ar Aramaic is a Syrian language. And uh, in the days of Christ, they spoke a form of Aramaic. And for hundreds of years after Christ, it was a common language throughout that region. Uh, so we, we have an Aramaic word in the New Testament, do we not? When we, when we pray to our God, Abba, Father, he says. And Aramaic was the forerunner of the language today that's called Arabic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They did not want their people to hear this kind of thing because it was designed to intimidate and to give them panic. And uh, But the Rapshaka said, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the Rabshaka stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. So, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Now we're getting down to the truth. Truth, okay. Was Hezekiah deceiving them? No, okay. So that was a, that was a, let's say that's a, at very best, a mockery. But people, uh, the enemies of God play with truth all the time. And the truth is called a lie, and a lie is called the truth. That's been our experience, and we're having a big time of that in modern times, a big problem with that. And, yes? And he said two things here. The Lord said, come up against the land, and if any of them would have known the prophecies, they go, yeah, there's been prophecies about Assyria coming. And now he's saying, um, you know, the, um, the city will be given into my hand. It's just Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think that it's having its effect. And they, and they would know about the Judean city being mm -hmm. captive on its way down. Yeah, they, they've already fallen. And it's just like dominoes, you know. How are you going to stop this last grand domino falling? Um, then he goes on to say, uh, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria. Notice he speaks just like God. Thus says the Lord, thus says the king of Assyria, he's the, he's the spokesman for the king. Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and eat one, each one of his own fig tree. And each one of you will drink water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Um, so what, is, what are his terms? Don't fight, we won't bother you. For now. <laughs> For now. But, you know, when we're ready... We're going to take you somewhere else, which means, really 
Yeah. Good place. Good as your own, better, maybe. You know. Uh, very tempting. But he is, he's telling them it's already settled. Your destiny is already established. You are not going to live here. You're going to live somewhere else. Now, what was the reasoning in that? Can you imagine? See, if we had done that in Iraq, do you think that we'd have lost so many soldiers? No. Uh, they knew what they were doing. They didn't want to have to fight this war again. Uh, we had Desert Storm, what, one and two? I've already forgotten the history of it. Uh, and there was, we, we, had the, we had the war under uh, H.W., and then we had to go back under W. And you see that happening. You see it happening uh, when Babylon later was ruling. Assyria did not want to have to do it twice. Do it once. You're done with it. And now you can rule because they won't be home. They'll be, they'll be dispersed. They will not have nationality. They will not have stability. They will not have unity to rise up and rebel against us. He says... Uh, Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath? That's up in the north, in Arpad. Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? We know where Samaria is. Uh, still, it's still there. Uh, he's saying, who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand and that the Lord or Jehovah should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Okay, so now he's... <laughs> okay, now, now he's actually, he's saying, our gods are stronger than Jehovah. Our gods are stronger than your gods. I mean... Brethren, that's not a good way to evangelize, by the way. When we try to preach the gospel to our neighbors and friends, it's not really all that great to say my church is better than your church. That's not what the gospel's about. Okay. The, the, the point is, there is right and there's wrong. There's truth and there's error. And God is one. There are not many gods. There are not many faiths, not many churches. There's just one. And we need to persuade our friends and neighbors who, who are worshiping in a way that's not scriptural, that they're not pleasing God. That's the real issue. It's not because our church is better than your church or closer to God in some way. That's how they think in the denominational world. And that's how they were thinking in the days of Rab the Rabshakeh. It was always a matter of this God's better than that God, and whose God's more powerful? And he said, now we are proving that our gods are more powerful than your gods. Verse 21, but they were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was of the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. And as soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest, and covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God 
and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. The word remnant is, is interesting here. Okay, We know that only a remnant will survive. Isaiah has, has used that word from the very beginning of the book until this and all the way to the end. And that becomes a part of the messianic prophecy and the remnant that God would save. But here he's talking about just simply physically all the cities have fallen and there are just a few left. Maybe Jehovah will save the remnant that's left. What will that require? Well, Hezekiah went where? When he heard the news, where'd he go? He went to the house of the Lord. What was he doing there? He was praying. He made his appeal. He appealed to Jehovah. Let's go ahead and read some more. When the servants of the king of Hezekiah came by Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid, because the words that you have heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. The Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning Terhaka, king of Cush, uh, he had set out to fight against you, and when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction, and shall be delivered. Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gosan, Haran, Resif, the people of Eden who were in Telesar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of Sepharvaim, the king of Hena, or the king of Ibna? Okay, Hezekiah has a letter. This is a very dramatic and beautiful scene where you see what Hezekiah does when he goes into the house of God. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, alone, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they are no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Beautiful prayer. Okay. He's not just saying, have mercy on us. What's he saying? He's reasoning with God. What are his what reasons does he have God? Does he give God? He he uh, he says, listen to what they're saying. Look at what they're doing. God has eyes. God has ears. God has power. Uh, he makes another argument in there as he appeals to God. All these other gods, all these nations and their gods, they have fallen. But they're not gods. Yeah. But you are not just the God of Judea. You're the God of all the nations. You, you see, Hezekiah gets it. He gets the point that God is the God who created the heavens and the earth. He is the God of all the nations. And he's worshiping and he's honoring, he's praising God. 
there, there's, there's great power, brethren, in praising God. Uh, that's obvious in what we read about in all the examples of prayer in the Bible. It's not just a ritual. It's not just words to say. It's sincere worship and praise. Why is that necessary? It's part of when we're, the New Testament described as praying according to his will. Yes. What we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to express what we think would be best for the Lord. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that we may be wrong, but we're trying to express this is what I think the kingdom needs. This mm -hmm. is what I feel like would help the kingdom, mm -hmm. help me to do this for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we're presenting arguments to God, but really it's for ourselves to, to yeah. learn how to think according mm -hmm. to his will. And what we see here is that the same thing that Jesus brings up in the Gospels. Because Jesus says, God will be glorified. Jesus said, glorify your name. He's about, he's about to go to the cross, and he's depending upon God to raise him from the dead. Okay? He's depending upon God's power to give him the victory over Satan. He says, glorify your name, and what does God say? I have glorified it, and I will glorify it. And that is a key issue here. Hezekiah gets it. He understands it, and he appeals to God on that, on that point. With the contrast of, look at how they are mocking you before the eyes of all of my people. In the Judean language, they all understand, they all hear this mockery of God and all the nations of the world. You remember that was the same kind of prayer that Moses offered to God whenever uh, they had made the golden calf and God had said to Moses, "Get, you know, step aside, let me destroy the whole nation. What will they say? Yeah. That, was a, uh, that was a great point. It's one that Hezekiah understood very well. Uh, I know our time is about gone. I didn't quite get done. Let me read a little bit at least of, of uh, the fall of Sennacherib. The Isaiah, verse 21, the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. Uh, this, is the, this is the poetry. It's written out in some of your Bibles in poetic form. It is poetry. Uh, it's Hebrew poetry, much of prophecy. The last from 40, chapter 40 all the way to the end is almost completely poetry, almost no prose there. But it's, it's the poetry, the, the beautiful poetry of God's expression of care for them. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I've gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon to cut down its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses, to come to its remotest height its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank waters to dry up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins while their inhabitants shorn of strength are dismayed and confounded and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass of the housetops blighted before uh, it is grown. I know you're sitting down. I know you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come to my ears. Why does he call it complacency? 
complacency of, of Syria, right? Overconfidence. They're not worried about the power of Jehovah. And Jehovah is saying, how could you not fear? I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. Now, that's especially powerful because we know from history and archaeology that's the way they carried their captives. They were the most cruel and ruthless in ancient times toward their captives. The Babylonians didn't do this. They were bad enough, but they didn't do this. They would put hooks in the flesh of their captives, tie ropes to the hooks or, or chains, and march them hundreds of miles home. And here, the, God is using that language to say, I'm going to put my hooks in your nose and my bit in your mouth. Verse 30, and this shall be the sign for you. Okay, give them a sign. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that. In the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear their fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Okay. Um, he doesn't, doesn't just say, the Lord's going to do this. He said, the zeal of the Lord will do this. You understand, fighting a war is hard work. Judging people is hard work. Carrying out the will of God has always been hard work. And he says that uh, in verse 33, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he shall return, he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city and save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. He had said earlier that, how did he put it? Um, back in verse, uh, um, verse 5 and verse 6, he says, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because the words, okay, he says, seven, I will put my a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Those are very specific prophecies. You see how specific that is? Those are historically verifiable. What we see in all this is God is telling Jerusalem beforehand what he's going to do in great detail. They're not going to shoot an arrow. They're not going to shoot a single arrow. What's, what's the odds of that in a war? That they would not shoot a single arrow how did Isaiah know that? What God said. And God does what he says. And this is the great message he just repeated over and over and over again. He said, okay, we've got three years here. You're going to plant and you're going to reap. You're going to, first, you're going to eat what you've got. Okay. Then you're going to plant and then you're going to have a, a, a harvest. So that means three years. What's not going to happen? You're not going to be fine. No more war. It's going to be over, at least for now. <laughs> but uh, this, again, year one, year two, year three, that's very specific. Here's what you're going to do in these years. Could they not see that as it happened? Could they not see those words being fulfilled one year after the other? It's written for a reason. 
And that reason is to give us faith and to give us hope and to realize who is in command and in, in whom should we hope and in whom should we trust. Thank you. Okay. Yes. One quick comment before we go. I just always thought it was interesting that a lot of his arguments with Jerusalem is your God will not be able to save you from my hand. Our, no God has stood before our God and he was slain in the temple of his God. His God yeah. couldn't even save him yeah. from being slain by himself. That's ironic. It's a very powerful irony. Uh, you go from the, the arrogant, arrogance of his boast to it completely turning around and coming down on top of him. Beautiful. Well, God bless you.